We actually have a line that we do at our house. We practice this thing. What is it? I'm Ariel Sky Williams. I'm eight years old. I'm unarmed and I have nothing that will hurt you. Okay, you ready? I don't fall down harder. <laughs> Anti-black racism within our school system can be measured in a number of ways. But one of the most troubling examples is what's referred to as the school to prison pipeline. That is when black youth face more discipline and harsher penalties in schools than white students. As a result, it puts them in direct contact with law enforcement and potentially sends them down the wrong path and through the justice system. <laughs> Well, I'd like to open with a territorial acknowledgement. Um, we are gathered here today. We're gathered virtually. And so we're kind of operating today across time and space. We're in different areas. I'm coming from the Lekwungen and West Saanich territories. And I think when I think about something that I can do on a daily basis in order to support um, Indigenous resurgence and um, sovereignty is um, try and learn things like place names, but also even if I struggle to remember the place names, like one, put the effort in, but two, also to know the um, translation so that I know what um, Lekwungen speaking peoples and Sanchakan speaking peoples, what was activated in this space. And then now kind of what's also happening as a continuation of this labor that's happened from time immemorial. And maybe I'll let you introduce where you're coming from today. Yeah. I'm joining virtually from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, what I know of this area is that there are many, many place names um, all around the Lower Mainland and um, Kalkamelem. And I think each nation also has maybe different variations of those place names as well. Um, so yeah, very layered. And I think that for me, what I know about the area that I that I work in specifically is um, Slowitus Elder Amy George. Uh, a lot of people know her as Ta'a. What she shared with me is that it's a burial site for her peoples. And I know that there is a relationship with the Squamish Nation along those that specific portion of land. And the request for the city was that they built um, a fence around the burial site and that request was never honored. So it's something I think about too, um, where I work and spend the majority of my time in. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I am so excited to be here with you again today and have this opportunity to um, revisit our conversation, how I kind of got to know you and your work. And then if you, if there are things that you'd like to introduce as well. Sure. I was really drawn to your work as an artist because you're also a multidisciplinary artist. You work in sound. You also um, have a teaching artist practice where you do uh, kind of like this uh, coupling that crosses um, time, time kind of continuums or like kind of recognizes the, the way that time operates simultaneously with past, present and future all as, as one happening. And I was really drawn to some of the drawings that you did and some of the work that you did with youth where you're having them um, kind of learn about 
a historical figure, but then you're also bringing them into these like very much like contemporary contexts and, and your methodology is also like the way that you're approaching doing the work is multi-layered um, in terms of its different artistic approaches and disciplines. And also that it seemed to be a common thread in your work that it was very much um, rooted in social justice and amplifying voices of um, equity deserving communities. And I, I felt like our practices aligned. And as I kind of followed you throughout the years and saw how you were also like beginning to share your independent practice, like outside of your, your practice as a teaching artist and educator. And so when the opportunity to came about to invite different artists to work with the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, um, you were one of the first people that I thought of. And I was really excited that you say yes, that you said yes. And um, the work that you made was so incredible, is so incredible. And so I'm excited to be able to kind of like dig into that today. And um, maybe you would like to share a little bit about yourself and your kind of interest in doing the project. Sure. Well, first off, thank you for those reflections. Um it means a lot to hear them from you because uh, you're also an artist that I really look up to. And yeah, I do find that the way that we work um, with different mediums is very similar. And it's, yeah, just really neat to also meet somebody who is working with other groups of people and young people um, to create things, which is not always an intersection that you come across of artists and then also facilitating artists as well. So yeah, my practice, I, I love the way that you summed it up in terms of finding the intersections of past, present and future. Um, and also really centering the stories of folks that have been historically marginalized and left out from narratives around how we've come to arrive to this land, how we were brought to these lands, kidnapped to these lands, um, and also just the different forces at play. I think a large part of that comes through my identity and um, for myself, I'm an Afro-Latina person. Um, my lineage comes from South America, from Chile, Walmapu territories, uh, Spanish ancestry. Um, and the other half of my lineage comes from Jamaica, um, the lands of uh, Arawak and Taino peoples and Maroon ancestry, African ancestry on that side. And for me, growing up in Amiskwichi Treaty 6, colonially, colonially knows, known as Edmonton, um, that was an experience that I never really got to fully immerse myself in, in terms of really reflecting on my own identity and what it meant to be at the intersections of those cultures. Um, nor did I ever see myself reflected in the curriculum when I grew up in, in Edmonton and Amiskwichi. Um, and so a lot of that actually came into fruition in my early 20s um, as I entered university as I also just stepped out of the schooling system and explored the world for myself. And one of the things that really opened the doors for me was um, volunteering at an arts-based youth camp and um, using my education degree and thinking about it and, and thinking about the ways that I felt that it lacked connection. Um, it lacked depth into just like everything that youth experience and go through and envision and when I attended that as a volunteer, it just totally broke me open. And, and I realized that everybody is an artist. Everybody has some sort of creative element to their lives. And um, I guess it just kind of helped me hone my practice as an arts-based facilitator um, and also use popular education as a way to connect people towards each other's experiences and also think about the ways that we can also affect future, not just uh, focusing on what has happened in the past and what's facing us, but how can we actually actively, proactively think about how we determine our futures as well. Yes, beautifully put. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
in terms of like moving into the work, there was something that you you're speaking to your lineage and then your experience growing up in what's known as colonial, colonially known as Edmonton. I'm thinking about the work that you created and how the two of us um, have roots in the, we're a part of the African diaspora, but, you know, very different lineages. Like my ancestors, the ones that I um, know of, uh, I grew up between the Cherokee and Catawba territories that is also colonially known as North and South Carolina. And like specifically between the, the mountains and the foothills. And my family goes back for six, seven generations or more in that area. And before that, I'm, I'm not sure. But what I find so interesting is that even though we have these different threads, um, the the work that you created very much spoke to um a unifying experience and you know when i talk about that not only when you're speaking to uh systemic violence but also when you're speaking to joy when you're speaking to um when you're calling it yamaya and then when you're talking about um like Christine Sharp has this positioning of kind of like the African dias diasporic experience, like being born in the waters of the Atlantic. And I think that's in her book, In the Wake. And so I think about your the threads that we have and also the threads that are in the work that you created. And I'm wondering, would you like to describe a little bit um, the work and and how you came to create it in that really layered manner. Oh, there's a lot to unpack there, and just noticing. <laughs> Sorry, start <laughs> start anywhere, um, and yeah. Um, and just noticing my own reaction too, as you shared when you were reflecting on your own lineage, as as far as I know, as far as I know of my ancestors, and it's like just that just hit me and it always hits me of like how so many of us of the African diaspora, we, we can't actually fully trace back in so many cases because that's something else that's been stolen from us. And, and there's a grief there, at least for me, there is a grief there to not ever know, to look at this giant continent and be like somewhere. Yes. At some point I was from there. I don't, I have no idea from where and just, just such a sadness for me around that. Yes. Um, yeah. And I think maybe there, that is subconsciously and at times consciously like a thread through all my work. And when I guess I look at, um, the theme of displacement, I think it's a common theme for so many people across the world mm -hmm. around how all of our stories in some way or another connect into displacement, whether we have the one are the ones that have been displaced or our families have, or we are the ones that are actively doing the displacing or historically have at some point or another. And I think it's important to examine those histories. And um, yeah, in this piece in particular, in the soundscape that I created, I wanted a way to invite people into a corner of my world um, of the thoughts that run through my head on any given day as I, as I walk around um, the city. Um, and I noticed within myself that I was stumped for a little while around the theme of future and you know, the prompt of blueprints for an Afro future. And despite my work being really focused on it for myself to reflect on it and to not guide a collective process around it, where I'm kind of listening to what the voices around me are saying, um, I notice myself be stumped and, and, and wonder about like, what, what is, what is future? What is future for black communities in particular? What are we building towards? And, you know, there's so much of that, that, I think the, the big reason of why I'm stumped is because that has been something that historically that imagining that envisioning has been historically taken away from our communities. And 
when I think about, again, the, the, the connecting thread around displacement, I think about specifically the papal bull and how that document um, in the late 1400s set in motion um, the colonization of essentially any lands that weren't European, um, any lands that weren't Christian, which was the global majority at that, that point in time, and how it also enabled the theft of human beings, specifically so many millions from the African continent. And so I think when I when I came across that, that prompt, I, I started connecting all of these pieces around, you know, the ones that were stolen from across the water that at some point that's where my lineage comes from. Um, and I wanted to speak to that in the piece. And I thought about all of those that didn't make it um, that, you know, even on their their journeys, making it to the departure points where people were brought on board, that a lot of people um, collapsed and didn't make that journey, and how many people uh, passed away on those ships because of the conditions that they were carried in, and how many people also jumped off as a form of resistance, as a way of like, you will never enslave me, you will never control my future. And that was a big piece that I wanted to be included in that is those acts of resistance and placing all of these threads through time and space and also bringing us into the present now. And for me now is when I think literally about future, it's the kids that I work with. It's the the young people that I work with. They are the next generation, Um, especially when I'm working with high school kids. It's like, I see that turnaround happening within five years of of people taking that knowledge and and doing something with it. But um, I really wanted to focus on the younger voices of the children um, in and around me, involved me, with me in some way or another in my life or through community. And I thought that their voices were really important to center in this soundscape, um, as well as those voices and, and naming the names of the people who are no longer with us due to colonial violence, due to police violence, white supremacist violence. And we can't have conversations about future if we're not also talking about the factors, the systems, the policing forces that endanger our lives every single day, that literally take our lives away from us, that take community members away from us, that incarcerate us. And that that thread also needed to be included when I thought about future because it's like, how do we talk about future and how do we protect future yes. at the same time? Yes. How do we ensure a future for ourselves and communities? Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's beautiful. And you also wrote, you wrote a poem, but you also, there's, um, there's singing or like a, a humming in it as well as laughter. And I was wondering if you could, um, maybe talk about some of the the layers so you have the the voices of the youth and you have the names that are being repeated um and you also like have these other sound elements in it and i'm i'm just curious as to what your process was around including the humming and including the um because the way it all worked together um, and the way that you experience it is incredibly powerful. And I found that it hit kind of different parts of my body all at once, you know, but, but also like it, it just, it had a way of, of coming in through all of these different access points. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, like the laughter, the, the humming, the poem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so many points of entry, like you said. I I think the one of the main threads that the the soundscape starts with is with the voice of Robin Maynard, and um, as she lists the names of the people that have been killed in police interactions um, in so-called Canada in the last decade, and. Um, that was something that was, like I mentioned before, really important to ground ourselves in is this conversation about future acknowledging that there's so many that we've already lost. Mm -hmm. And in conversation with that and 
contradiction with that in, in a way are the voices of children um, kind of chattering, laughing, playing. And that was an invitation that I made and I extended out to um, friends of mine um, of the African diaspora to just record a moment of play uh, wherever they may spontaneously find it in their lives. Um, and layered underneath that is, um, yeah, the sound of the kalimba. And for folks who don't know, kalimba is an instrument that's indigenous to the African continent. And um, I can't fully say that I'm <laughs> fully proficient in it, but um, I do go through periods of time where I just play with it and kind of just get lost in a little bit of a trance, a little melody, and was playing around with it and started just laying um, it down on my looper and just kind of vocally improvising over it to see what would come out and layering my own voice, harmonizing with it, and then just kind of sat with it and, and noticed what feelings came out for me. And um, within that, I, I started layering all those different components. Um, and yeah, I think one of the biggest pieces that that at the beginning, especially just really jarred me and that I, I noticed and I, I get emotional almost every single time is a specific clip from a video that was recorded about four years ago um, in the US. And it's the voice of a little girl, um, Ariel Sky Williams, who is talking to her dad about what she does um, to practice any interactions with police that she may have even as a young girl, she's eight years old and hearing her voice and then hearing the laughter and hearing the humming and like this almost like lullaby, the soundscape mm -hmm. was something that just completely transformed the piece for me and, and helped open the pathways of, of where I wanted to take it. Really? Cause it, it has this, um, this ability to be both, heartbreaking um and it it just resonates you know so it's so real like yes that is the experience these are the conversations that are being had between parent and and child you know yeah, yeah um, something that I don't think also that that people who are non-black think about and, and, and that was something that I wanted to bring in because there comes a point where we read statistics, we see the media, we see the headlines of people being lost of such and such police interaction or, you know, uh, white supremacist violence incident. But, but we never know the other side of it, of what it actually means to grow up with that, yes. grow up with having to set certain protocols or teach your kids certain things so that they will survive in this world. Yes. And that to me was an important window to bring also non-Black listeners into the piece and into the experiences that so many of our communities go through and have gone through. Yes, yes. No, that's, it's incredibly powerful. And just that acknowledgement that even if you are not necessarily the one to die, by this violence like there is something in you that is continually being shaped and reshaped you know like you're you're constantly um navigating and um and rather than being able to focus on um how the world can support you like you're also needing to navigate and these are the systems in peace that are designed to to end my existence like to end what i have to offer this world and like yeah and so even even if it, it's not affecting you directly it is indirectly and and directly even if it's not physical like it's it's shaping you so thank you for that um Another question that I had was, you know, if there's something that you really want people that listen to your soundscape and experience the work, um, what it is you're hoping will land with with folks or if that's completely open, maybe you don't have a. 
I mean, I do feel that it's it's pretty open. And again, the reason that I, I wanted to to go with Soundscape because I I really do see the possibility for certain um elements to hit you in different ways and depending on where you're at or what you're thinking about or what your point of connection is um you're going to be paying attention to certain parts more than others and i think that's okay and um and at the same time i wanted people to understand that these things are always relevant to communities of the African diaspora, whether it be Black History Month or not, um, or whether it be the next time an incident of white supremacist violence or a police-involved shooting happens. Um, it's it's always within our community, these things that we have to navigate, these barriers and these, these threats to our lives that we have to navigate. And I think for me, I wanted people to also carry that in their hearts still because of what I have seen happen and in conversation with another member of the community who was a young person through the LA riots and saw this cycle of people feeling mobilized, people feeling like they wanted systemic change to happen, that no more violence against Black people, um, that systems needed to change, and, and the feeling of hope and momentum and seeing that same cycle happen again with the murder of George Floyd. And, and two, three years later, we're seeing that same kind of movement dwindle, and if not, go back to exactly the place where they were prior to his to his death, go back even maybe to a place where we're even more in danger because a lot of people have a sense that things have changed when they actually haven't. And so I think for me, I wanted to leave people in their awareness of these are children that we're talking about. These are the next generation of young ones, of, of people that are going to go out into the world um, and change the world potentially. But they need to have their survival insured yes. and and that needs to happen through focusing resources on you know the lives of black kids it needs to happen through um protecting their futures and looking at things that structurally um put them in places of harm that structurally put them in places where they're more likely to be involved with police or not have enough supports around mental health um all of these things I want people to to understand that uh it's it it carries it carries beyond just the month or the headline um or the year. Yes. And and there's a lot of work to be done in that and it's always immediate. Yes. Exactly. I think about, you know, when you mention um creating these safer spaces for youth and um a notice that I received from my teenagers school where they're, you know, really uh, fighting to have a, a police attendant at the school and, and how we're like, that is absolutely <laughs> the last thing that we need. You know what I mean? Like that is, that is not how we begin taking these systems apart. That is again, like, it is cementing a system that is problematic and deadly, you know? So thank you for mentioning. Um, yeah. And I'll just add to something that I was reflecting on the other day is that music has always been a means for our communities to come together and organize and talk about the issues facing us. And um, I even think about the Candoublé riots in Trinidad that started because too many people started drumming. Um, and that drumming also brought together communities of African descent and also South Asian communities together and talk about their conditions that they were working on and, and working in and forced to work in and talking about freedom. And I'm also thinking about pretty much in every single genre that um people of African diaspora create musically, there is always a thread going back to the impact of policing on our lives. Yes. And I would argue that there's maybe no other genre by predominantly like non-Black folks um, that has that same thread. 
I was thinking about, you know, songs about like old folk songs that still talk about the impact of policing on our lives and thinking about reggae songs um, that talk about that same impact, blues songs. And it just makes you think for a second. I'm just like, I would be hard pressed to find another genre from non-Black artists that that carry that same thread for as long as as we've had to carry it for. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because we don't often get to share in public spaces the desires that we have for ourselves in our own lives. And um, there's a storyteller, uh, Halise. She goes by the name Halise, named after her grandmother. And she's a pretty popular YouTuber and does a lot of Adobe um, like she had an artist in residence with Adobe Creative, as well as uh, teaches a number of workshops on Skillshare. And she said the way that she got into um, YouTubing and, and filmmaking storytelling was because she knew that if she didn't tell her own stories, that there was a possibility that someone else would be telling the stories for her. She was kind of specifically thinking about Sandra Bland because she was also in Texas at that time. And so I'm asking you personally, what is it that you want for your future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind because of that quote is um, I want to write a book. Um, I want to write a book, rewrite a book about the life of Seraphim Fortes. And um, it's that actually a quote I've really been thinking about too. Uh, an Audre Lorde is my reference point to that. The same idea of like, you know, so it wasn't for me writing, I'd be crunched into other people's imaginings and desires. Um, and yes, absolutely. So that's something that I'd like to do. I'd also am... Um, gonna some way figure out a place <laughs> for myself and my partner and my mama who's aging to live together and have solid housing yes. um it, which is which is so foundational to be able to have that security to work from to create to support others from and i would love to just focus a little bit more inwards on my own art and creativity in the next while um still immersed with you know the physical training the body positive training that i do um for for others and also for myself um but also i would like to see myself shift more into my own work in this next uh kind of span of time um more specifically because what i what i realized actually around the time of the murder of george floyd was that I was putting in all of my resources to educate and create change, which I needed to do. And I felt that I needed to do at that time. Um, and not realizing also the impact that it was having on my spirit and the impact that it was also having on my body as somebody living with AS and like already prone to stress inflammation and realizing too, that when I talk about these heavy topics, when I hold these heavy topics in my body and help others work through, which there is a lot of value and need for, but I also carry that home in my body and it lives with me. And so it was actually since then that I've started shifting more into my own arts practice and working more with youth. Um, and yeah, I'd like to see myself continue more of that creation reflection process for myself in, in the next while. Thank you. May mm -hmm. I ask what is maybe one thing that this world could do to support you? Um, I think a really great way to support me would be to support, my work um, online and virtually and share my work. And this is huge because what's happening to a lot of Black and fat and queer content creators is that we are getting censored through Instagram and other social media platforms. Um, and 
slight tangent, but I noticed actually the other day when I looked at my least interacted with accounts, they were actually all black run accounts um, that I would love to see more of in my feed, yes. but I'm not seeing any of it. And so that's a really great way that people can share, um, to follow, stay updated, turn on your notifications for my posts on Tierra Negra Arts on Instagram, Autonomy YVR on Instagram, and stay tuned with my website as well. Um, and also like, I'm, I'm not shy about also receiving donations. If you're feeling like, you know, I just really want to support this person in whatever way that, um, they see fit and in terms of buying a coffee for that person, or maybe this enables you to take a step closer towards your home or, or anything like that, or getting a nice, like physio treatment or something. I'm, I'm game for that. And, um, I think those are the most meaningful ways to support me at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you to speaking. Thank you for speaking to your needs and your desires. And thank you so much for the beautiful work that you create and put out into the world. Thank you. I actually just thought of something. The piece ends with an affirmation that the yes. children are all saying out loud. Um and so when I listen to it, it, it brings me to tears to, to hear them saying it so confidently and just putting that out into their bodies, into the world. Um, and that for me was so important because it's it's the voices of um, African diaspora youth. And it was their voice it was their voices being recorded after we had read a book by Mariam Kaba together that talks about the impacts of um, incarceration um, disproportionately on black and indigenous communities. And after reading that storybook, they had been sitting with these feelings of, of deep sadness as one of the children expressed and were very quiet and, and reflective. And for me as a facilitator, I didn't want to leave them with that. And I thought ahead of how do we also shift this and yeah. get them to recognize their own genius and their own magic and, yeah. you know, their own supreme beingness. And I thought immediately about affirmation work. And so that piece is really important to carry us into future of that affirmation being spoken um, by the next generation into future and that's exactly what they're going to be beautiful loved blessed and free um and yeah it's a beautiful affirmation um from another fellow african uh, diaspora artist so yeah thank you just so much. yes no thank you because that that is um such a critical part of the experience for participants so again thank you so much yeah yeah absolutely well, I will end this here, but I hope that you have um, an incredible year and that that everything that you are just like calling in and speaking to existence, that the ancestors are listening and the descendants are listening and they're carrying your hopes, your dreams and desires. Um into this world where we all get to experience them alongside you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. Beautiful.